Each week, uh, I think about you all week. Most of the time, it's very pleasant. Um, (laughs) But the reason when it's not pleasant is because life is hard. And, And we gather here this morning as a family and we bring all our stuff with us. You know, I almost wish we had a, you know, a security thing like at airports where we could check all our baggage and, and come in here because some of you are carrying some really toxic stuff. But the people of God say, we're in this together. And I want to remind you before I, I get into our text and before this commandment of something that you probably already know. You are deeply loved by the living God. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you any less than God already does. That is confirmed by the power of the cross and the resurrection that now lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't just say that because that's what the guy on the stage holding a Bible with an untucked shirt is supposed to say. I say that because I believe it. With every ounce of who I am, I believe that we are the beloved children of God. Let's pray. God, would you be with us as we listen, as we tune our hearts and remind ourselves that it's all for the glory of you. Every setback, every win, God, you exist in both of those tensions both of those realities. So pour through me now the gift of preaching, of story and imagination as we dare to think what it might look like to live life with you as king. For it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. The late Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, Uh, Pretty much all the honest truth-telling in the world is done by children. And, And you were a child once, and you were more honest than you intended to be once. But having four of my own, I've experienced this. I just last week, one of my children, who will go unnamed, got into the vehicle of someone in here that will go unnamed, and they simply blurted out, this is a mess, how gross. Makes you feel real good as a parent, doesn't it? But truth-telling has its place. Or several years ago, when another child of mine, who will go unnamed, was in the grocery store with my wife, and she looked to the person checking out in front of my wife's cart and said, Mommy, that lady has a huge bottom. (laughs) To which she simply turned around and said, Yes, I do. And then she turned around and kept checking out. (laughs) Uh, Honesty is something that you have to be careful with, don't you? But when we talk about honesty and the Ten Commandments, what we're doing is we're moving something that could be private into a very public space. In other words, these are words not for you to practice an individual faith, but words for you to learn how to exist with one another as the people of God. And so you don't kill anybody. Yet you don't have a relationship that's intimate with someone who's not your spouse. You don't lie. You don't covet. Why? Because we don't live or have the luxury of privatized lives. We live life publicly and we show up here with all our stuff. And we're invited to dare to tell the truth. So don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Perhaps another way of saying that is tell the truth, which is really hard to understand, especially in a world like we live in. Ponzi schemes and politics. I mean, if you don't know who this character is, uh, you've been living under a rock. This is Robert Mueller, who's taken a lot of our well-earned tax dollars in the last several years. 
And so the question this week, especially in Washington, D.C., has been, uh, who's telling the truth here? And then, of course, it would be easy if we thought truth was always hard to discern outside of the church, but a lot of times truth inside of the church is where we struggle the most. I mean, how honest do we really want to be with our neighbor? The truth hurts. And, and the truth is hard. But I want to remind you of something that just springs forth from the ten words as God is forming God's people, that even though the truth is hard, even though the truth hurts, truth is holy. And the reason it's holy is not because truth is bound up in words on a page or etched in tablets of stone, but rather truth is holy because truth is bound up in a person. And the person is God. So here we have Israel at the base of Sinai listening for God's instructions. Not just how to be good little Jewish boys and girls, but rather how to live life together. And if you remember back when Moses challenged Pharaoh, he said, I need you to let God's people go so that they can come and worship God. We forget that sometimes about the deliverance from Egypt, that God wanted to deliver the people of Israel, from one God to learn how to worship or relearn how to worship the only true God. It was a contest between the little G God and the big G God. And as they wa wandered in the wilderness with God in a cloud by day and a fire by night, they were learning what it was like to come to the true and living God. Truth was not just about words Truth was about a person. So God said, look, if you're going to be my people, you've got to be truthful people. And Israel had a hard time with this, didn't they? And so God, throughout the story of Scripture, began to embody what truth meant. And then finally, according to John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling place among us. Dwelling place being the same word for tabernacle. That wilderness language, tabernacled among us. And then John says, full of what? Grace and truth. E even John said, I'm testifying to the true light. So Jesus embodies Truth, if you want to know what truth looks like, you look at God. And if you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So you can't separate understanding bearing, bearing false witness from what it means to be a true witness. Because a true witness is somebody who sees God who sees God revealed in Jesus. And because of that, they are moved to embody truth as a person, as a disciple of Jesus. Which is perhaps why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, one of my friends who's a professor in Abilene uh, leads a group of young men in a monk-like lifestyle, uh, meaning that he helps them with spiritual disciplines. They check in week in and week out, and, and they really try to live exactly according to the Sermon on the Mount for an extended period of time. Where they ask, what if we took Jesus seriously? And one of the assignments is they have to go an entire week with only responding to a question with either yes or no. They can't say maybe. Maybe. I mean, if you think about it, when somebody says maybe, it really doesn't tell you anything different than what you already knew before that, right? Do you want to go to McDonald's? Maybe. Well, what did you tell me that I didn't already know? Thank you. It's either yes or it's no. Truth telling. It's hard. It can hurt. But it's also holy. But, but truth telling is only the first half of the commandment, isn't it? Don't, don't bear false witness. Tell the truth to your who? 
What's your Bible say? To your neighbor. Now, now that's an interesting word, isn't it? Neighbor. Neighbor means different things to different people. Well, here in uh, the book of Exodus, the word neighbor, the Hebrew word, actually does not mean an intimate, close friendship. Uh, The word neighbor actually means like your neighbor, your fellow human being. So this is not like your BFF or your spouse or even your brother or sister, even though it's really important to be truthful to them. This is about people that you live in community with, your neighbor. And, and God is serious about the language of neighbor. Let me give you a few examples. In Leviticus chapter 19, I love Leviticus, said no one ever, but Leviticus 19 verse 17 says this, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin, your family, and you shall not hate your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. Don't take vengeance or bear a grudge against anyone, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what it says next? I am the Lord. Truth is embodied in a person. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 15, uh, talking about sabbatical year and and taking a break. Listen to what the writer says. If there's anyone among you in need, a member of your community in any of your towns, don't be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your neighbor. Not just your Jewish person that comes over to help you fix your faucet. Not just the person that brings you food when you're sick and you're in the hospital. Your neighbor. You see, we are bound to one another Because God created all of us. And as my friend John Ortberg says in his book, everybody's normal until you get to know them. Because we're all neighbors. We're all connected. And I didn't really appreciate the connectedness that we all share through the God story until I ran across a book written by Desmond Tutu called No Future Without Forgiveness. Uh, if you like autobiographies, get this book. It is, it is Tutu's writing and reflection on how he and Mandela put South Africa, Africa together uh, post-apartheid. A dark, dark time in their nation's history. But Tutu mentioned a, an African concept, and I know that there's all kinds of different languages in Africa, but it's, it's shared across all kinds of countries. It's the African notion of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is simply this, I am because we are. And if you Google Ubuntu, you will find a computer program. That's not it. This is a rich word that cannot be defined by one singular word in the West. It's a concept. You only understand it when you practice Ubuntu. I found this picture on the internet, and I love this picture of Ubuntu, of children gathered around, and everybody is connected because they are simply people. They're not arranged in such a way where one is more important than another. They're not arranged necessarily by by gender, and one gender is more dominant than the other. No, it's Ubuntu. And Tutu said that's the only way South Africa could be put back together. Because South Africans slaughtered each other just because they were different ethnically than one another. Does that sound familiar? Do we might have some history in our own country of that? But Ubuntu is what connects us. And that's just not an African principle, my friends. That is a story of God principle. It's it's an invitation for us as the people of God to model what it looks like to not only tell the truth to one another, but we tell the truth to neighbors. Why? Because we are connected. Truth matters. So I, I want to take a little bit of a risk and push us a little bit because uh, truth-telling is all a matter of who you see. 
And I'm going to shake some of us up because it shook me up. When Jesus talks about truth-telling, guess who Jesus begins with? You. Uh, If you remember over in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus talks about judging other people. Or you could hear that as uh, giving testimony about other people. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, well, don't judge somebody until you what? Look at yourself first. And sometimes when we hear an invitation to don't, not bear false witness, we think, see, that's what you do. Sorry about the light, friends. There you are, right here. Look what you're doing. And Jesus says, no, that is not the way it works. Not bearing false witness against your neighbor looks like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now I can share with you a hard truth. Because truth-telling doesn't begin with the other person in mind. Your truth-telling is only as good as your ability to tell the truth about yourself. Isn't that what Jesus was getting at in John chapter 8 when he brings this adulterous woman into the arena? And some really smart, church-going people brought this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they said, Jesus, the law clearly says that we should stone such a woman. What do you say? The law clearly says, stone this woman. And Jesus says, guess what? If you're perfect, go ahead and throw the first stone. Don't bear false witness unless you're telling the truth about yourself. That, my friends, is hard. That, my friends, hurts. But that's holy. Is looking at yourself as a way of telling truth to someone else. Be truthful with who you are. Own who you are. And that takes vulnerability. And that takes great risk. But as the people of God, I think it's a risk worth taking. Truth begins with you. So it's a matter of of who you look at, but it's also a matter of who you look at. How you see another person, either as a neighbor or as a, a, a nuisance. Do any of you have the Next Door Neighbor app? Uh, this is a great tool because our dog, our very giant Great Dane dog, was let loose in the neighborhood, and we found our sweet puppy through Next Door app. So I, I, we had neighbors that called, and I was sold from that point on. I'm like, I want to be a part of the Next Door Neighbor app. What I didn't realize is that them uh, helping me find my dog was just a very small part of what Next Door Neighbor app does because what Next Door Neighbor app does, at least in my neighborhood, is it gives people an outlet to complain about everything that's going on in the neighborhood. I mean, just the other day, those kids were playing basketball at midnight. That is too late. I need to file a police report. Well, it doesn't sound like the next door neighbor. It sounds like the next door nuisance. How about you? And it's all a matter of how you look at people, isn't it? Because it's real easy to bear false testimony against someone you don't like. (laughs) It's really easy. Well, to tell a hard truth to somebody that's really harmed you. But but I think the essence of truth-telling The essence of the gospel as it relates to our neighbor is our neighbors are those that gather around our tables. Uh, I read a fascinating book this past week. And and the title of the book was The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Don't you love that title? 
And it's the story of uh, two uh, of a family in Durham, North Carolina, who exhibit what they title Radical Ordinary Hospitality. If you think you love Jesus, read this book. You don't love Jesus as much as these people. They budget money for meals to take to their neighbors every week. Budget money. These people are crazy. They'll love anybody. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter their sexual identity. It doesn't matter their past, whether they've had one husband, four husbands, three wives, two wives. It probably doesn't even matter if they're living in a polygamous family because guess what? The gospel comes with a house key. I mean, it's shocking. And the whole time I kept reading this, I, I, I thought to myself, man, this is hard. This could be really hurtful. But you know, this is holy living. This is truthful living. The gospel comes with a house key. Is it any wonder that Jesus, in Luke chapter 11, 10 and 11, when he sends out the 72, tells them not to go to church? Where does he tell them to go, family? To people's houses. And you eat what is set before you. You're not just simply the host. You are the guest of neighbors. The gospel comes with a house key. And if you think about the story of Zacchaeus there at the end of Luke chapter 19, why do you think Jesus had a right to tell Zacchaeus the truth about what he was struggling with? It's because the first thing out of Jesus' mouth to Zacchaeus was what? Zacchaeus, come down from that tree because you have sinned greatly. Here is water, Zacchaeus. What hindereth thou? Let's go ahead and clean your act up so then I can come to your house. Is that what Jesus says? No. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. The gospel comes with a house key. And just when I thought this couldn't get any more, <laughs> any more direct, I went back and looked at Acts 10 and 11. You know how we journeyed through Acts 10 and 11 with Peter and Cornelius a few months ago, church? And Cornelius, this Gentile Roman, shows up at Peter's doorstep, and Peter's like, oh man, I had a dream too, and I guess God doesn't show favoritism anymore. Can I just show you what I've been missing? Look over at Acts chapter 10. Underline this. Highlight this. Because in my Bible, Peter doesn't begin to say, I truly understand until verse 34, which means that there's a pretty good chunk of verses that happen before verse 34. Now watch verse 23. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. And the next day he got up and went with them And some of the believers from Joppa came with him. And the following day they came to Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them, and called together his relatives and close friends. Do you hear the gospel that comes with the house key? Peter wasn't able to understand that God didn't show favoritism until he sat at the table with somebody who was a nuisance. And the nuisance became a neighbor. You want to know how to be more truthful? You don't know how to practice truth-telling? Start with yourself. Look at yourself and then look at those around you as neighbors and not just people to accuse or folks to judge. What would it look like if the church took the risk and it wasn't just children who told the truth, but it was children of God who told the truth. So let me leave you with this. Surprise, surprise, a movie. Last week, a trailer came out for a movie that I've been waiting for for several months. The uh, incomparable Tom Hanks is going to play Fred Rogers. That's not Tom Hanks. That's Fred Rogers, by the way. But there's this renewed fascination with Fred Rogers and the Fred Rogers story. And if you haven't seen the documentary, go watch it. I can recommend it wholeheartedly. But one of the fascinating things about Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' neighborhood is that it taught children truth. 
And it was truth that was fairly radical. Uh, the truth of accepting uh, a female's voice in town and city leadership and government. The truth that allowed Mr. Rogers to take his shoes off and put them in cool water next to a police officer who was wrapped in a different colored skin in the 1960s. Fred Rogers, when he was interviewed, said, behavior cannot simply be taught. Behavior is caught. Let me say that again. Behavior can't always be taught. Behavior is caught. In other words, truth-telling is not just a mental exercise or words that you read on a page. Truth-telling is caught by being around people who tell the truth. So the words of God for the people of God are this. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Because the truth begins with you and the gospel comes with a house key. Let those who have ears to hear, hear the words of God. Amen.